What's up everybody? We are at Mammoth Cave National Park and we're gonna go on another uh, really awesome tour. Um, so if you uh, click the card, wherever it is up here in the corner of the screen, um, I'll link you to another tour we did not too long ago that was the historical tour. Um, this one is the cathedral um, and dome tour. Um, I think you're really gonna enjoy it. This is the first time I've done it, but I've seen some pictures. It's gonna be really cool. Uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. Enjoy. Okay, I realized that I had the tour name wrong. We are going on the Gothic Avenue tour. So let's have some fun and explore Mammoth Cave National Park. Hello, how are you? Will do, thank you. All right, looks like we'll be headed down through the same entrance as we took on the historic tour, and the entrance will be the same uh, as that tour, and then we will take a veer off up a set of hidden stairs that we missed on the first tour, and then down Gothic Avenue. So, very much looking forward to exploring a new part of the cave with everybody. So, we'll start walking in just a minute and head down into the cave. This is the pre-tour briefing. 
Don't touch the rocks. Don't touch the bats. Don't leave the group. Stop right at the top of these stairs. Gotcha. And let's see, Quentin, we are we do have disco going today, right? I believe so. Okay, but we are going to get ahead of them. 
All right, everybody. So welcome. Uh, welcome to Mammoth Cave. This is the longest cave on Earth. We can talk about that a little bit later on in our tour today. Um, for how many of you is this your first time to Mammoth Cave? Awesome. It's my first day, too. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Sometimes people don't get it. Uh, look, hi, here we've got the historic entrance. Um, and I, before heading down into its steps, I always like to share this story, the story of a, you know, what really put this place on the map. It's sort of a fun and interesting story. So um, this story of rediscovery goes back to the 1790s. Uh, this is kind of like the Wild West, right? This is the frontier, uh, and the family living out in this area is the Houchins family. Uh, so they have a son named John. He's about 10 years old, uh, and he is sent off by his father to go find dinner for the family. Uh, right? It's not the grocery store. This this is the grocery store. So he goes out into the woods and he goes into dinner. And so he's seeing a couple things, potentially, you know, he's seeing a few squirrels. And he's seen deer way off in the distance. So he thinks, you know, let's, let's just continue on, see what we can find a little bit deeper into the woods. And so as he continues on, he eventually finds something black and furry uh, rustling around in the bushes. Uh, any guesses what it was? Yeah, yeah, black bear, exactly. So he takes the Kentucky long rifle that he's brought with us. He takes aim and bam, fires off that shot. Uh, when that dust has settled, he approaches the spot where the bear had been, but it's no longer there. But he does find some blood and he follows that trail of blood, which then leads into this deep, dark hole in the ground. So according to the story, John then follows this bear uh, and rediscovers what later becomes known as Mammoth Cave. Uh, so, uh, if you had just injured an animal with sharp teeth and sharp claws, who would follow it into the yeah, into a deep dark hole with that? Yeah, there's always at least one hand, a couple, usually kids too. Perfect. Okay, so uh, some of us would, some of us would not. Uh, you choose what you want to believe, whether whether or not this story is true. Um, what we'll be doing now, we'll be uh, what I want to do is get us back into Gothic Avenue. It's about a similar 10 minute walk from here to get to where that is. Uh, so we'll be we'll be passing some cool stuff. Do know on the way out, we will have a chance to take photos of it and look at it a little bit closer. So um, don't feel disappointed if we're walking past uh, cool stuff and you're like, wait, what is she doing? Well, we'll we can uh, we can look at it on the way out just with the timing of the way we choose it. So um, without further ado, I guess, do you want to check uh, tickets up here? I can. Yeah, so if you guys pull your tickets out, Quinn, uh, Ranger Quinn will check them. Uh, once again, my name is Ranger Emily, and I will, uh, let me just sneak up to the front. Uh -huh. All right, we'll see you in there. All righty. Thank you.
All right, keep on following me. We will have a chance to see this room on the way out and a, a better chance at that point. Sounds good. I was wondering where these stairs went. All right, and so what I'm going to have you guys do, just hang out on the outside of this gate, and then I'll let you guys out when we're, when we're ready to head on up there. Sounds good.
I hit my flashlight. I, uh, I often hit the wrong button. Not part of my job description, and not necessarily I'm anything I'm interested in. No, you know, no, because the sections that haven't been explored have a huge hurdles. Yeah, and there's a reason they haven't been explored yet. So you're swimming, you're scuba diving, yeah, you're crazy. Uh, going through really tight passageways. It's uh, not anything I'm interested you in. About that guy, I forgot where it was a few years ago, they got stuck upside down. Uh, John dying. Jones, yeah, probably yeah. in Utah. Yeah. yeah, that's. I don't want to recreate anything no, like that. It was a, that was sure. a bad way to go. Yeah. All right, guys, go ahead and uh, come on into this area here. All right, um, I see a couple of headlamps. I am fine with, uh, you know, shining some lights and stuff. Just be really mindful with your lights that you're not blinding anybody. And if that gets excessive, uh, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll reassess at that point in time. Um, so we are going to be going up into Gothic Avenue to my left up here. Uh, what we're in right now, this is called Booth's Amphitheater. So there's a couple things uh, I want to talk about before we head up into Gothic Avenue here. Uh, so I like to talk about all the things that the cave has preserved, whether they're stories or physical artifacts. Uh, we will uh, explore some of those things that have been preserved over this cave's uh, history. Uh, so we've been seeing a lot of things preserved as we were walking in, uh, including what we're looking at right now. Um, so we have all this, uh, you know, wooden infrastructure here. Thank you, Ranger. Um, so these are leaching vats from an old saltpeter mine. So shortly after our young friend John followed that bear into the cave, it was found that if you had some sort of flame and you brought it near the dirt, that a, a spark would ensue. And so this indicated that the soil was rich in nitrates, that it had something called saltpeter in it. Uh, does anyone know what saltpeter is a key ingredient in? Yeah, gun exactly. Gunpowder. Black gunpowder. Exactly. So that's really important, right? This is the frontier that you need gunpowder to, to live your existence out here. Uh, and this, again, became very important in 1812 because at that point in time, uh, our old enemy, the British, they're not being very nice to us. They're blockading our ports and, and otherwise just really bullying us. And so us being a young country, we don't want to stand for that. And so we once again declare war on our old enemy, the British. And so very creatively, that becomes known as the War of 1812. Uh, and so this became the site of a very large saltpeter mining operation. So the first really uh, big, beautiful, spectacular room we were in, um, all that wood we were seeing, that's from that saltpeter mining, uh, the sort of uh, logs that we were walking past and all this in here, um, that's from that saltpeter mining. And so what that process looked like was just gathering up the dirt that just naturally occurs in this cave, placing it into these leaching vats, these little squares here, and then running water over it. So that water, if you remember coming down the stairs outside, that waterfall that we saw, that water was piped into the cave and that helped leach out that saltpeter. Uh, and that saltpeter was then dried and sent off to a young company, E.I. DuPont. So yeah, that name sounds familiar. DuPont Chemical Company got their start here with Mammoth Cave saltpeter, turning that into gunpowder. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, cool connections there. Uh, so this cave environment does a really good job of preserving stuff, uh, whether, you know, whether that's physical things or just, uh, you know, what, whatever's been left behind, it gets preserved really well because uh, just the environment, right? So it's a pretty cool environment, uh, pretty stable, uh, more or less it's about 55 degrees year round, uh, some fluctuations in that, but pretty, pretty constant overall and uh, relatively dry. We're not really going to be dripped on too much today by any kind of water sources. So um, the, those combination of, uh, of um, uh, forces there uh, help to preserve stuff inside this cave. So all of this wooden structures here, these are not replicas. These are originals from that 1812, uh, you know, early 1800 saltpeter mining operation. Uh, so what we'll do now, we're going to continue up the stairs into Gothic Avenue. Actually, hold on a thought. One more thing before we do that. Uh, what is the namesake of Booth's Amphitheater? Well, I want to tell, tell you guys that because it is a bit interesting. So uh, Booth's Amphitheater uh, is named for a certain individual. Um, so who has heard of Edwin Booth? Anybody? Okay, quick. One, one, one person. Uh, who's heard of John Wilkes Booth? Yeah, I love our hands on that one. Um, so they were actually brothers. Uh, they were both brothers who were actors for their time. Uh, and so uh, at the time, Edwin was a much more popular actor. Uh, and so John Wilkes was a, seemed to be a bit jealous, right? Um, but he quickly uh, made himself much more notorious with his assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. 
So as a result, after all that happened, uh, Edwin's reputation is really tarnished, right? His brother just committed this, uh, this horrible act, and so his reputation is tarnished. Uh, he goes into bankruptcy. Um, so a couple decades after this assassination, uh, he wants to rebuild himself and rebuild his reputation. So he goes out on a tour uh, and performs his, the part he's most famous for, which is uh, Hamlet, that to be or not to be soliloquy. So he comes here to Mammoth Cave and actually stands right up there uh, on these rocks here and performed, uh, performed that to be or not to be. And th thereafter, this became known as Goose Amphitheater. Hmm. Uh, so we'll, we'll look for a few other people who've, uh, who've come to the cave, some of the famous, uh, famous faces that we've seen in this area. Okay, now we will go up the stairs. Uh, we've got the stairs you can see here and then two more stairs beyond that. I'll have a light shining on them. Uh, we call those the stupid steps because nobody has any idea why they're there. They don't seem very necessary. So just don't trip on the stupid steps. Uh, up on the ledge behind me here uh, and was a very 
you know, sort of important uh, part of the tourist attraction to Mammoth Cave. Uh, so we are a national park, at least in part uh, because we are one of the first tourist de destinations in the United States. So this in the Niagara Falls was two of the first destinations for tourists. Uh, so that was officially recognized as 1816 as the start of that tourism season. And obviously, uh, we're still doing that today for over 200 years of that. Uh, mummies were a big part of our early tourists, uh, what they were interested in. Uh, so remember that cave environment, right? It's dry, it's cool, relatively constant temperature. It does have a job uh, for emerging stuff, whether that be salt fear, um, you know, wooden objects, or body. Uh, so with this body that they put on this room, uh, she was given the nickname of Fawn Hoof. Uh, so when they found her, she had obviously been placed inside the cave, uh, and she was dressed really elaborately. Uh, she was dressed very nicely. Uh, with a you know, nice robe, nice garb, uh, and she had a necklace of baby deer hooves. Baby deer hooves. So she became, uh, became known as Fawn Hook. Uh, Fawn Hook was the nickname for this one. Uh, and so later on, so several decades later, about the 1850s or so, uh, she actually goes on tour. There's a visitor coming, uh, finds this Fawn Hook, makes it pretty interesting, and wants to take her on a tour uh, and show her off to uh, the rest of the world. Had a drum of interest in Manic but as soon as you take that body and take it outside of this cave environment where it's cool and, and uh, stable, uh, her body did not fare very well, and she did uh, begin to diminish in quality. She did start to take it down with uh, spiral. Um, there's also some limited reports that maybe they were, uh, for like a little extra tip, you might be able to take a little piece of the with you. Yeah, I know. So it's weird, it's weird, you know, it's weird. But uh, over time, right, that body does begin to so today she is a box in the Smithsonian. She's just a box of bones in the Smithsonian uh, from what she had been, this uh, mummified remains of a Native American uh, from several thousand years ago that she had been placed in the cave. Um, we don't know that much about her. We think that she was probably, you know, a, um, like a respected woman, maybe royalty, maybe a medicine woman, uh, because of the way, the care in which she was placed. So she's placed with kind of like rocks around her to sort of protect her. Uh, she was sitting upright and right, that necklace of baby deer hooves uh, indicated some sort of a, a prestige or um, respect or something. So that is, that is what we believe about her. But um, the tribes who are coming into this cave starting 5,000 years ago, they are different than the tribes we see in this area today. Uh, and so we don't know that much about them. Uh, we call them the archaic woodland tribes, but you know what they call themselves, we're not really sure. There's a lot of mystery when it comes to the, the Native Americans in the cave. Um, you know, first, first uh, individuals coming to the cave, uh, probably just curious, right? Coming to a cave environment, probably just curious. Um, but we do find later on that these Native Americans, they were, uh, they were mining stuff. Uh, not so they are mining other things. They are mining crystals that naturally grow inside the cave. Uh, we're talking uh, gypsum, moravolite, and epsom. These are salt crystals that are naturally exuded by a dry cave environment. Uh, but for what purpose, we're not really sure. Uh, we, you know, epsonite is a name kind of applies for like epsom salt helps with muscle uh, relaxing and stuff like that. Um, Moravolite we do know to be uh, helping with digestion, so we think that's probably what that was used for. Um, but the gypsum is this big mystery where we have no idea what they were using it for. Uh, gypsum today is, a, uh, is in drywall or sheetrock, uh, but with any of these crystals or these salts, as soon as you take them outside and get them wet, they are totally demolished, and so that archaeological record does not exist. Uh, so before we continue on, I do want to open it up if we have any questions so far. Any, uh, anything I've talked about or anything I haven't talked about. Any questions so far? Yeah. About the I'm sorry. Did you, about the say, did you say anything about the writing? I did not. I'll come back to that. Yes. Okay. Oh, I was going to be on the same thing, but sure. uh, I see all the historical yeah. paintings. Sure. How about Native American like, petroglyphs? Yeah. Here? Yeah, that's a great question. We do see some petro uh, pictographs and petroglyphs, not very many. We won't see them on our route today. Um, unfortunately, one of the the ones that we see on uh, one of our routes that I hope is the Battle City tour route, uh, 1,800 visitors wrote right over it. And they didn't really, 1,800 visitors didn't really recognize that we might be really interested in that, right? And they think that's really cool and really value that. And to them, it was just like, oh, whatever, like, it's, you know, like, who really cares, right? And so um, other things that happened, a lot of the artifacts that they left inside the cave uh, got burned, uh, got gathered up and just uh, put in piles and burned to produce illumination. So unfortunately, a lot of uh, that uh, what was left behind uh, has been destroyed completely or very much damaged, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, but it, you know, one of the ones that we see is kind of like a big circle, a kind of spiraling circle, and it's sort of like a lightning bolt. But yeah, what do they need? Uh, no one really knows. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's cool that they exist, but yeah, unfortunately there's a kind of a caveat with that. Um, I'll come back to the signature question. Any other questions? How big is the cave? 
a big, uh, I'll do the length, 420 miles. As far as volume goes, I'm not totally sure about that. It's a big cave, right? So 420 miles, that's from here to Atlanta, distance-wise. Right. But it doesn't spread out all the way to Atlanta. Instead, it's actually really wrapped up like a big bowl of spaghetti or a big ball of yarn, if you will. Uh, so it's really contained within Kentucky and within the National Park itself. The National Park is 53,000 acres and is very contained. So despite being such a long cave, it is very uh, kind of compact, if you will. Um, you know, there's passages sort of you know underneath us. Where we go, there'll be you know it'll continue on. It kind of intersects with the cave. It just kind of goes all around. Is it connected to some of the other ones you see advertised? Or Not necessarily. Like Diamond Caverns, for example, uh, any of those private zone caves, um, no. Like as, as they've explored, they have found some of those connections. Um, 1900s, we see a lot of uh, privately owned caves that we now realize are uh, are connected, but at the time they thought, like, here's my cave, here's my cave, here's the other cave, you know, and we do know those are connected. But Diamond Caverns, uh, to our knowledge, is not connected. I think most people think it probably, it almost certainly is not, um, just based on kind of the, the levels and the geology and stuff. But um, they're, they're always pushing, they're always pushing to find more, uh, more different things. We continue to expand. All right, I do want to come to your question. So the signatures, we start to see the signatures, and we are going to see a whole bunch more. Uh, would anyone like to guess what medium was used to make these black markings here? Coal. Coal. Yes, candle. Candle smoke. Coal to break out. Candle smoke specifically. Uh, so we'll see a lot more of that. Uh, early 1800s visitors, in addition to not recognizing the value of uh, Native American rights and all that, uh, were quite small, but they had really long arms. Uh -huh. They were able to. <laughs> signatures up really high uh, seems to have been a very long stick with a little uh, nail at the end of it that they could then put the candle on and dot by dot by dot they would write their name. So we'll see tons more of that. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple. So we've got uh, George A. Tapsot right over here. And again then we have George A. Tapscott. So we do know George Tapscott was an employee at the inn. Uh, and we, we're not sure which happened first, but I think uh, what I believe happened is he wrote his name, took forever to write it, he's all proud of himself. He takes a big step back and he's like, oh my gosh, I spelled my own last name wrong. How embarrassing, let me fix it. I'll write it over here now, George A. Tapscott. You can kind of see he's rushing at the end, not quite as distinct. Uh, yeah, not quite as big either, but uh, we'll see some kind of interesting ones as we continue on. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later on.
These, oh, oh, go ahead, sorry. Were these pillars built by... Well, we'll get to it gotcha. right here. Can you guys uh, hear me okay in the back there? Yeah. Excellent. Let me know if you can't. Uh, so we are starting to get into what we call Registry Hall, just from all the signatures we're seeing, uh, right? Kind of uh, good name. Uh, and we are starting to seeing what we call monuments, right? All these kind of big piles of rocks here. Uh, so the earliest visitors coming in, it was pretty common for them to want to leave a, leave a mark, like, right, like leave their name, uh, indicate to their friends and families who might come later that they had been in the cave. Uh, people have been, I guess, marking on the cave for thousands of years, so I guess that kind of does make sense, uh, though today uh, it's a federal offense, so don't do that. Uh, but, but, you know, 1800s, that was a, that was a common practice. And so uh, the, what would happen is they would produce a, a tip to their guide, uh, usually at nickel, and they would then give them that candle nub that they could then to, uh, use to smoke their name. Uh, so as time goes on, the owners of the cave uh, come in and kind of ch checking things out, and they're seeing so many signatures, right? And they start to say, if you have so much time to be letting people write their names, uh, why don't you spend some time making the trail better, making it easier for people to walk? Because uh, what the trail looked like was just big piles of rock that they're kind of just working their way through. Um, not much of a trail at all, really. Uh, and so the guides, uh, it is important to highlight, these are enslaved people. These are enslaved black men who are the guides in the early 1800s. Uh, they come up with a plan that would make Tom Sawyer quite proud. So as visitors come into the cave, uh, you know, wanting to write their names, they say, we have a better deal for you. Uh, so, you know, where, where are you from? Uh, Columbia, Tennessee. Columbia, Tennessee. We've never had someone from Columbia, Tennessee today. Would you like to leave a monument to Columbia, yes. Tennessee? Okay, so for five cents per rock, you can take these rocks on the trail and build yourself a monument. Yeah, deal, deal right? That's a good deal. So we start to see these monuments built, and as a result, the trail starts to improve. So kind of win-win situation for all. Uh, so every one of these monuments has a name. I certainly don't remember all of them or even most of them, but this one, right, this one's kind of looming here. Uh, what, this is to a state, and I'd like to ask you guys, what state do you think this monument is to? Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah, I heard it. I always get like California, Texas, New York, and then at some point Kentucky. So good job. We got right to it. Yeah, Kentucky. Uh, and part of that too is any, any monument that reached up to the ceiling, guides would come back in and kind of lower it so that their home state of Kentucky <laughs> would stay, you know, looming large and proud on the horizon here. So this is called the Kentucky Monument here. Uh, so I do want to highlight with these guys, right, they are enslaved people. Um, they are learning stuff from their visitors, right? These visitors coming in, in order to be able to afford a vacation, you do have to be pretty well educated and pretty well off. And so uh, a lot of times these people are coming into the caves and they're teaching their guides some stuff, right? They're teaching them sometimes other languages. They're teaching them to read and to write, which is knowledge that uh, pretty much all enslaved people did not have. Um, they're teaching science too, right? Scientists want to come and study the cave. So they're learning a lot from their visitors uh, despite being, you know, the lowest rungs of society. Um, and so the, the one guy I want to uh, talk about for a minute, Stephen Bishop, right? We saw his signature back there, the S-T-E. P H E N. So Stephen is our most famous guide here at Mammoth Cave. He was brought to the cave at 18, in 1838 at the age of 17, uh, given a lantern and told to take people out on tours. And he quickly took a, a liking to this job and also fell in love with the cave. And so we'll talk more about him uh, as we continue on. He kind of pops up here and there uh, on, our, on any kind of historical uh, themed uh, uh, or focused tours. So we'll, we'll continue to talk about him. Um, we'll continue on a bit more. If you do have any questions, hang on to them. We're kind of, we'll, we'll get to a better spot to answer them just up ahead. But um, start looking for some of the years, right? In addition to the names, we do have years left behind. I see like 1837, 1831. Uh, start to look for some of the years, how, uh, what kind of spread we're looking at. See if any year in particular is, is pretty common. So you guys can keep following me.
So now that we have anybody, um, do we have any other questions so far? Yeah. So about the writing back there, there was a lot of Greek letters that were carved. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good observation. Uh, a monument or a sort of nod to fraternities was also pretty common. So you might see, I don't know, like Delta Tau, Delta, you'll see, or whatever, Sigma Phi, Epsilon, whatever. Um, we see a lot of those monuments as well. Yeah. Have all these names been recorded and like researched to see? I believe so. I don't know if they've, every single one's been written out. I believe they have been counted though, mm -hmm. and many of them have been researched. So um, we'll have just kind of these random connections where they'll figure out, you know, someone, and then they find out they're, you know, this was a honeymoon for a couple, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they manage to track down the grandkids and the grandkids might even have photos the photo albums of the grandparents right so we um, in the winter time when it's a little bit slower there'll be guides who will do research they'll usually find a particular signature that's intriguing for whatever reason or it's maybe next to something important but um, that's definitely something we do look into and it's it's there's a lot of signatures, so there's yeah, a lot right. of research that's still left to do, and it's, it's pretty cool. cool. Um, we'll get people who are relatives who come in, and they are looking specifically for their relative. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, I guess you could call them like micro-celebrities at Mammoth Cave that we, you know, we guides get excited about. Usually the, the other guides, like the, you know, Stephen Bishop, we always get excited when we see, when we see his signature. Um, Albert is another guide. Ed Bishop. Um, any of the brands for it. So we, we always get excited when there's these uh, yeah, micro celebrities mm -hmm. that we're like, yeah, we found one of them, you know, <laughs> Max Kemper. So all these names, I know you probably, uh, I can't go into all of them, but these are people who had a really big role and really shaped this cave in, in one way or another. And when we see their signatures, it's always a, a pretty exciting thing. Yeah. Any, I, did, I thought I saw a hand over here a minute ago, just, uh, aside from you. Okay. Away in the back, I got gotcha. you. One more question here. Um, is this the only section that has most of the signatures in it, or is there some other areas? I thought I've seen an article just recently that had, um, from like National Park Association, that they were doing research and going down deep into the cave system. And, and uh, I'm unfamiliar with that article, and I'll have to look it up when I get back. This is this is the area where the the signatures are really front and center, in particular the smoke signatures. Um, but if you just do just like a regular historic tour, you'll see smoke signatures, but you'll also see um, writings. That one we see a little bit more of the more contemporary uh, graffiti at that point where we'll see, you know, we'll see something from like 1931 and then next to that will be like Bob 1975 and it's like, ah! <laughs> Yeah, so this section tends to be, you know, we'll still, still see some of those, but um, with the historic route, that was a self-guided route for about a decade. And so that's where, unfortunately, we got a lot of damage when people are left to their own devices because, you know, people be people, you know, sometimes things never change. Do you have an estimation of how many signatures are There is an estimation. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, we, we probably are the cave with the most amount of signatures. So I know there was another cave that was trying to say they had more and we were like, we literally have like 10 times more than that number you just said. Um, Quentin, do you happen to remember the number? Again. The number of signatures we have in the cave. I know that it exists, but I don't remember what it is. I'm not for sure. The CRIF would know. Yeah. They have a whole category of all the names. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, yeah, I apologize. I don't remember the exact number, but it, it really is a lot, especially just being a long cave system, too. Yeah. Yeah, how many of the 400 or so miles are accessible by tour? Uh, about uh, 10 to 15, kind of depending on the time of the year. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that's like uh, yeah, not very many. Um, there is a pretty good reason for it. So there's uh, routes that used to be, uh, you know, toured, you know, in another time period. Uh, those areas potentially have 
uh, artifacts or something that's a value that we are potentially damaging. Um, other reasons too is just the physical nature of it. If there's a you know a really tight squeeze or a water crossing or something like that, that certainly kind of excludes those. Um, right, we're trying most of our tours. We're trying to keep you in the upright position. Uh, we do have crawling tours. Those should be coming back uh, in a couple years. They went away with COVID and then kind of COVID plus uh, the trail that they use for that is going to be renovated. So that whole section of cave will be closed. So in a couple more years, if anybody does come back and look into those crawling tours, because that's a, you know, that's a specialty thing. We want to make sure you're up for squeezing through tight spaces before making you do that. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So whenever we like breathe down here in our carbon ash, so when we breathe, does it do anything to the cave? No. So our air, airflow in the cave is going to be really good. I think, um, yeah, like the carbon dioxide. Yeah, two. I don't believe when we're really having that much of an impact is breathing out carbon dioxide because overall our airflow is really good in the cave and it does kind of breathe in and out. It replaces whatever is in the air periodically. Um, all, most of our tours were near an entrance and in particular the historic entrance. There is really good airflow in that. So that uh, air is coming in, going out. We've got all these kind of cracks and fissures. So air is able to replace itself pretty easily. So um, we're not really building up enough of that carbon dioxide to have any kind of um, like real impact. And, Bad air, that's just something we don't really deal with in a, in a cave system this large and massive. All right, so shifting gears a bit, we'll have another spot for questions and answers just up ahead. Uh, this sort of iconic looking thing in front of you, I believe it's in the, uh, the photos on recreation.gov for this tour. Uh, this is called the Bridal Altar. Um, and I would like to tell you guys a story about how it got its name. Uh, this is a story that's been passed down from one generation of guides to the other. Uh, we gotta do this the right way though. We gotta act like we're in the 1800s instead of in the 1900s. Oops. Let's try that again. Government lighter, let's go. <laughs> there we go. Ooh, right? Way more fun to tell the story this way. Okay. So the story goes, uh, once upon a time, there was a mother and daughter. Uh, so the mother had been slighted by men her whole life. The father had abandoned her and her young daughter. Uh, and so she had come to hate men. Uh, and so as time goes on, this mother unfortunately gets sick. Uh, and so on her deathbed, she makes her daughter promise to never marry a man on the face of the earth. They are scum. You must never do it. Uh, so the daughter willingly agrees, right? They're, we've got a pretty close relationship, so she willingly agrees to this. Uh, unfortunately, then the mother goes and passes on. So time goes on. Daughter's uh, doing pretty good. She's pretty self-sufficient. She's living her life. Uh, but then eventually she meets a young man. And this young man, he's so charming. He's tall, dark, and handsome. He's so dreamy. And of course, they fall in love. Uh, and this daughter doesn't want to forsake this sacred promise that she made. Uh, and so they are thinking about it and trying to figure out what they can do. Uh, and one day, that man, that uh, tall, dark, and handsome man, has this idea. You know, you promised to never marry a man on the face of the earth. What if we come underneath the face of the earth? Yeah, then, then maybe we can uh, not break that promise. And so the daughter agrees, and they come down into Mammoth Cave to the bridal altar uh, where they wed and they live happily ever, end, uh, happily ever after the end. Aww. Who doesn't love a good love story? Uh, so that's that's a story we've kind of we passed down. Uh, we always enjoy enjoy sharing that one. Uh, the other thing that pretty much all tours have done over the time is uh, show you guys Mammoth Cave in its truest and most natural state. So uh, to do that, I do need your help. Uh, so if you have anything emitting a light, uh, cell phone watches, uh, anything like that, put it away. Uh, cool blinky shoes, if you can just stay still for a minute. Uh, we wanna, wanna show you guys that, uh, that mammoth cave in its most natural state. You guys think you can do that? Yes? yes. yes. Okay, yes. we're gonna do it on the count of three. You guys ready? Yes. One, two, three. Yeah, so this is uh, pretty hard to replicate uh, anywhere else on Earth, uh, pretty much just the bottom of the ocean or inside a cave is where we can have that uh, truest and most dark state. Uh, any questions? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, that's my favorite joke to tell. I always enjoy that one. All right, we can uh, we can bring ourselves back in time. Machine. I'm gonna shoot. Oh, here we go. Boop. Boop. Okay. Yeah. So, so 
what we'll do from here, so uh, we'll be leaving our bridal altar, we'll be seeing on the way back. Um, I know some of you guys are trying to get photos. We can do some photos on the way out as well. Um, we have got another set of benches just ahead of us here. Um, so we will continue on, and we can talk geology at that point in time, because we've kind of forsaken it. We can answer all your geology questions. So um, if you guys are ready, start following me.
right, guys. So if you want to um, go up to kind of the edge here and look out, this is called Lover's Leap. And once you've had a chance to see it, then go ahead and grab a seat on these benches so the people behind you get a chance to see it. I just like to track. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I totally get that. All right, guys, as you're coming, go ahead and take a look over the edge here. And once you've had a chance to see what's over the edge, grab a seat on the benches so people behind you get a chance to see it. Uh, and then we'll talk to y'all as you are all Ago, uh, so old the dinosaurs didn't even exist yet. So actually, a very very long time ago. Uh, the animals that called this ancient sea home, uh, we see corals, uh, we see something called sea lilies, also called crinoids, and we even see bigger animals like sharks. Uh, so these animals called this ancient sea ho uh, home, and over time, when those bodies eventually, uh, you know, these animals die, those bodies collect at the bottom of the sea, and that creates this layer of limestone. Uh, so then more recently, limestone gets moved through plate tectonics to where we are in Kentucky today. At the time it was laid down, it was more closer to the equator. Uh, and so then ancient rivers are coming into the cave and they're dissolving away the actual cave passageway. So the rock itself, we're talking about 350 million years old, but the actual cave passageway, we're looking more like 10 to 15 million years ago when that was happening. Uh, so uh, above this layer of limestone, though, is a layer of sandstone. Uh, and this sandstone is really, really important for why Mammoth Cave is the way that it is. Uh, so the sandstone layer uh, keeps us really dry. You guys are asking about water. That sandstone keeps a lot of moisture out. It's basically like a roof over our head. So we don't see that much water uh, or moisture really getting inside this cave because of the sandstone. And it's also it's also why we're the longest cave on Earth because uh, if you have a lot of water coming in, that water is dissolving the limestone. So uh, limestone's very water soluble. So it's dissolving it away. And before long, that roof roof looks like Swiss cheese. And so by having that sandstone layer, it's keeping us dry and it's keeping us really stable and able to therefore be that uh, very long uh, cave system at 420 known miles. Uh, the sandstone is also why we don't see a ton of stalactites and stalagmites, although we are certainly seeing them today. Uh, so the actual sort of mechanism for making all these formations, uh, the water's coming in, it's dissolving, overlaying limestone, and then through very slow drips, it's redepositing it into stalactites, stalagmites, columns, soda straws, all these different kinds of fun formations. Uh, so in this room, you know, or I guess I should say in this whole tour, um, the formations haven't been that sparkling crystal white that we're used to. Um, they've been more on the black side. Um, there's two reasons for that. Some of it is manganese. Uh, manganese is mixing in uh, as a mineral and it gives it that dark appearance. Uh, but it's also from uh, older visitors coming in and that smoke and that soot from uh, open fires, from lanterns, uh, even, you know, Native Americans, their torches burning, all that, all that smoke and all that smoke does leave behind a mark, a black mark. 
uh, and has uh, over time kind of stayed these, uh, these formations black as a result. Uh, so that's the geology, American Cave Geology 101. Um, what other questions do you have about either, I guess geology or I guess exploration kind of ties in. Any other questions kind of related to that? So is there underground water underneath the cave? There is, and I should say it's still in the cave. Um, it's going to be about 400 feet below the surface. Right now we're probably... 150 or feet or so beneath the surface, something like that. So several hundred feet lower than we are right now. Uh, those rivers are in the cave, actively forming these cave passageways. Uh, we have one tour that goes down to the river that's called the River Styx. Uh, and so it is pretty cool. It's a very geology focused tour. So you would learn what I just said over two and a half hours instead. So uh, very geology focused. And it is, it is cool to go down and see the river. I have no idea what the availability is today, but it just it heads up, it does exist. So. If you were down here doing an earthquake or something, what would it feel like? Yeah, great question. So most earthquakes we would not feel. Um, earthquakes, for the most part, well, don't they affect the surface rather than uh, like a cave or anything below the surface, just the way those w uh, waves travel uh, and what kind of waves we see. So uh, we have had times where, uh, you know, cave tour will come up and, uh, you know, people on the surface will be like, hey, do you guys hear anything weird or see anything weird or anything weird happen? And they're like, no. Like, what? In, and they're like, okay, well, there was an earthquake. So they're filling it up on the surface. We inside the cave have absolutely no idea it's happening. Um, it's got to be a pretty big earthquake for us to feel it. And so we would hear it more than feel it. Um, so in 1811, there was a really big earthquake, the New Madrid Fault. Um, they had about an 8.4 on the Richter scale. So very, very massive earthquake. Inside the cave, the saltpeter miners were uh, hearing more than anything else. They were hearing really weird noises. It was really frightening. And so they began to run it back towards the uh, out, outside of the cave. Um, at that point, it had stopped shaking. Uh, but then they were dealing with daily aftershocks where um, just kind of weird noises, weird feels, weird vibrations, um, but definitely worse on the surface. So with that 1811 earthquake, um, yeah, they were hearing it. They were feeling it. They were experiencing it but it was so big that the Mississippi River ran backwards for three days because of all the, the rocks that had sloughed off, it actually caused the river to run backwards. So definitely worse on the surface than inside the cave. Uh, as kind of weird, yeah, as weird and spooky as caves are, we're actually, any kind of natural disaster, we're in a pretty good spot for, right? Thunderstorms, tornadoes, any of that, we have pretty much no idea what's going on. So um, that's the good news today. We're, we're, if anything happens, we're in a good spot for it. What's the uh, longest back you guess on like history of uh, civilizations inside of these caves? Five thousand years is, is how far back we have evidence of, of their travels. Uh, no evidence that they ever lived inside the cave. Uh, probably the the entrance area, kind of rock, like smaller rock shelters, um, may have lived that or, or kind of getting out of a storm. But um, really going any kind of any depth inside the cave, no one ever was living back there, um, which kind of makes sense. It is on the chillier side in here. There's nothing to eat. You got to keep fires burning so you don't you know find yourself in the dark and you know kind of up a creek without a paddle you know so um and uh that so we see that evidence of five thousand years ago to about two thousand years ago and then uh nothing after that there's no evidence of people coming in um maybe they were coming in and not leaving evidence i think that's kind of unlikely we're not really sure why they stopped coming inside the cave um, maybe they just no longer needed the minerals that they were mining. Maybe they were kind of nomadic and moved on. We're not sure, um, but we do see the, the stopping of that the travels about 2,000 years ago. And then in that 1790s, that's when, um, so no people. And then 1790s, that young boy chasing the bear is kind of the first documented case of people coming back in. Why is it called Mammoth Cave? That's such a great question. I can't believe I haven't answered that yet. Uh, so uh, I believe it was 1812, somewhere in that time frame, uh, a visitor comes to the cave and he writes a newspaper article about this cave. Um, at the time, the owner was named uh, Mr. Flat, and so it's called Flat's Cave. And so he wrote about his trip to Flat's Cave with its mammoth-sized passageways. And that really captivated the attention of people. They really liked that descriptor. And so they completely forgot this guy's name, and they remembered Mammoth. So they just kind of put the two together, and it became known as Mammoth Cave. Yeah. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't answer that. So thank you for reminding me of that. And we have time for one more question. Yeah. I felt like it was called Mammoth Cave, so I felt like a man came in here. Yeah, right, that's so, that's so obvious, right? Like a mammoth would have come in here. Uh, funny enough, we don't see any evidence of any kind of woolly mammoths coming inside the cave, but we have found a, I can't remember if it was, I think it was a bone or maybe it was a tusk of a mastodon. So similar animal, but a little bit different. Um, may have come in the cave, or maybe its bone was brought here by like an animal that had eaten it, something like that. So uh, that's kind of the, the fun irony. It's no mammoths, but mastodons, we, we do have that. <laughs> 
Oh, it's always fun when that happens. Um, so we'll continue on, on, on our journey, journey back. This is our turnaround spot for the tour. Um, the formation that's kind of lit up there on the left-hand side, that is called Jenny Lind's armchair. So take a look at that as we're passing back by it. Uh, Jenny Lind, if you've seen a, a Greatest Showman, she was in that. Uh, prior to that movie, I think most people had heard of her. But, uh, she was a really popular uh, opera singer for her time. Uh, late 1800s, she was a Swedish nightingale was her nickname. Uh, so she came on the cave, got uh, into the cave on a tour with Stephen Bishop, uh, and uh, had this really beautiful voice. Uh, she was very philanthropic. Uh, so they tried to grab onto her celebrity and kind of name things after her. So she did actually come and sit on that armchair. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, there's another thing called Jenny Lynn's Table, which she didn't even go to that section of cave, but they were grabbing onto her celebrity and kind of using that to, to drum up publicity and all that. So. Um, take a look at that, and then we'll do a, a handful, uh, right, two or maybe three stops on the way out uh, uh, as we make our way back to the surface. So. Hello. Hello. I'll do a little pause and see if it's quiet so you get a chance to catch up. All righty. Jenny Lynn's armchair, right here. Probably not the most comfortable armchair in the world, but there it is. Right here, she can sit right there. She's out there. How long have you worked here? Uh, about nine months. Nine months? Okay, very cool. Have you been a ranger at other national parks? I have, yeah. So I, I've been with the Park Service since 2015. Wow. Where else have you worked? Uh, so pretty much it's like all been out west, uh, Yellowstone, Death Valley, Denali, Canyonlands, um, Olympic, a couple of them there. So. Amazing. Do you apply or are you assigned yeah, to different parts? Yeah, it's, it is an application. So yeah, a lot of times people think it's like the military, you get like yeah. sent around. But no, it's, it's definitely, definitely still a job, definitely uh, an application process involved. That's fantastic. <laughs> and which one do you like the best? Here on the right, so just just a little bit of water for you guys. <laughs> that's uh, that's the best I can do on this tour. Is
All right, guys, so if you want to get a photo of the bridal altar, this will be your time to do so. Um, we'll have a, a very brief stop. Just okay. Feel free to grab those photos if you want. Um, oh, wait. How about that? How old are you going to be park park? Since 2015. Where did you go to school? Uh, I went to school in San Diego. I studied uh, psychology. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my geology is like five minutes. So I like the things I don't know that as much as I wish I knew about. Have you been here? I've been here since the office. Uh, so I worked in all parts out in the West, and then came out here. Kind of, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I love, I love what I do, right? I love seeing people into nature, into our national parks, and really showing them the park and, and connecting with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love what I do. I love what I do. It's very, very enjoyable. And this is a yeah. job where you get to do that. Also. We're doing, we give up three tours a day, so uh, Ranger Quentin and I will be back in the cave in like an hour and take a whole new group of people and show them that section of the cave. Um, all right, everybody, so uh, Ranger Quentin's going to sneak up here to the front. If anyone does want that photo of the bridal altar on our way out, just go ahead and grab that now. Um, so we talked a lot about the 1800s, right? This is really what we, most of the history in this section of cave is really in the 1800s. Uh, so late 1800s, uh, the Chicago World's Fair is coming around, and Mammoth Cave wants to represent themselves. And so the, what better thing to represent Mammoth Cave than a some sort of formation, the stalagmite in this case. Uh, so they sawed off a stalagmite and <laughs> sent it to the World's Fair. Uh, we don't know where the stalagmite has gone. It has since uh, unfortunately disappeared. Uh, of course, that kind of, uh, you know, taking of the cave was not always great and it kind of leaves an eyesore. But in this particular situation, we do get to see the inside of a stalagmite, which is pretty cool. So Ranger Quentin is going to highlight that for us today. So we are going to go a single file past what he's going to be lighting up. Once you've had a chance to see it, kind of just keep on moving so the folks behind you get a chance to see. Chicago World Fair. 1893. Oh, yeah. 1890 something. All right, perfect. Whoa. Yeah. So once you've had a chance to see that, go ahead and start following me again. That's pretty crazy. I'm a little bit slow.
It's probably full of last stuff. More, more stuff. <laughs> yep, not a lot of people behind us. <laughs> <laughs> So was the cave pretty silt free or did they have to like hand pull a whole bunch of dirt out of here to get these caverns? Uh, so the, there's definitely plenty of dirt that was left over by those ancient rivers that had just washed it in. Right. Uh, the nitrate in that dirt oh, was Oh, that's from, right. They were mining the nitrate. <laughs> yeah. So the nitrate in the dirt was coming from the bats that were in this cave. Their guano is rich in nitrate. So that's uh, where, that, uh, where that was coming from. Uh, so... All right, guys, we do have a group coming in. Step to our right hand side. I heard the voices behind me, and then your voices are like. I was waiting for you guys to like flash the lights on me because I, I was just like. Uh, I had to do the bat wing ears. Ah, uh, have a good tour, Jim. Yeah. You got it. This is so cool. Oh, Taylor.
<laughs> All right, either uh, either Matt here. I don't care. It's busy, it's busy today, and it's a beautiful day. Okay. okay, guys, well, thanks for coming. Um, so you will start heading up the hill to get back to the parking lot, visitor center, bathroom, other bathrooms. <laughs> All that. Thanks Thank for you. Guys. Appreciate Thank it. You. No problem. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that fun hike through another part of Mammoth Cave. We'll come back and we'll do it again. Um, next time, we're going to try and do the frozen Niagara. So thanks. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Uh, subscribe if you're new here. Uh, thanks so much. We'll see you next time.